Markets making uh, more gains yesterday and a few more, a uh, little bit, a little green today. Major averages uh, yesterday closing for the fifth, higher for the fifth consecutive uh, session. The Dow uh, now on its longest winning streak in three months. And futures this morning up about 25, 26 on the Dow. The S&P is positive again, up about a point. NASDAQ up uh, just about nine. And uh, we know that uh, today is impe the impeachment vote will be had in the House of Representatives. Joining us to talk market strategy in the last few trading days of the decade, Charlie McElligot. He's a managing director and head of cross-asset strategy at Nomura, uh, and CNBC markets commentator Mike San, uh, Santoli. So um, impeachment is today. Markets have been trading at a series of, of new highs. Um, how do you how do you what's the calculus there? What's happening? Why, why yeah. does it seem to be so muted? The reaction in the markets. I think the simple acknowledgement that where this stands from the Senate perspective is that it's just another historical footnote and it doesn't impact this transition that we've seen kind of from the 2019, start of 2019 story, which was this fear of the end of cycle trade metastasizing into a recession because of the China trade war dynamic. Now pivoting back to the last three months of the year, which has been this repricing of growth higher um, into a much more optimistic outlook into 2020, that's where the focus is. So you've pivoted back to effectively this Goldilocks era of lower rates, monetary policy that's supportive of expansion on top of 2% GDP growth. And it's a great environment to be long risk. You think, Santoli, that market participants are factoring in what this does for the election in November 2020? And, and deciding that it may be a positive or maybe not a negative. I think there's nothing incremental or new to, to price into the electoral probabilities based on what's going on with impeachment. I think that's what the market effectively is telling you. If you looked even at the, the kind of the betting markets for the handicapping the election, it hasn't really moved that much in terms of prospects for your election. So I don't think the market's ignoring anything, but I also don't think they see anything here that says it changes the story what in if, November. What if the uh, impeachment proceedings had really shifted to 70 percent um, that people were favoring removal from office. And what if that had swayed 10, 12, 14 GOP senators? Yes. What would the market I think the market right then now? gets nervous about it and they probably and goes down and probably goes down a little bit. OK, so it's sort of That's saying that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so that we you know, can again, because we, that would filter into we can the, to do the something aspects. So we can to do something from this. Right. I okay. think you can deduce the, the market's non-reaction. You can you can. OK. Well, on. I mean, the thing that I would that I would, the analog that I would make was kind of, you know, within two months ago where the market began to price in that Elizabeth Warren uh, move higher with regards to her probabilities. And there was yeah. an amount, a significant amount of hedging that went on into that March period um, where you'll be coming out of the primaries um, with regards to the impact of policy on corporate earnings on the loss of the dollar as um, kind of this haven status with regards to uh, the U.S. tax profile for global corporates, um, with regards to closing the inequality gap, with regards to MMT, all of these policy potentials that, um, you know, frankly would be a dollar outflow, capital outflow, growth negative. That's, that's where this could have gone if you saw a really aggressive shift um, and there was some sort of smoking gun on the Trump stuff. The fact of the matter is, People look at this, I think, by and large, as you know, a pretty politically driven dynamic and pretty divisive. And we know that that is kind of the state of the world right now. It's not changing where people stand going into November. Yeah, I mean, you, you have, I think it hasn't changed the story where you have an economy that, you know, on a neutral field should have a 60% presidential approval rating. And you don't. And you right. haven't had that. And so that hasn't changed for, for three years. Right. You've had that polarization. And I think we're in the same spot here. And interestingly, I mean, the, the, the dynamic that Charlie's talking about in terms of everyone now all of a sudden saying, hey, we got this growth, growth revival to price in. Now it seems like as we get to the end of the year, people are kind of just like, you know, topping off their tanks of risk and buying, you know, high yield bonds and lo loving the credit and loving the cyclical stocks on the hope that the numbers confirm that going into next year. So um, you don't see at this point inflation. The Fed, corporate profits, global growth, none of those things that next year seem to be uh, a, a problem at this point? Or what, what, what's the biggest 
worry that you would look for next year to, to, right. uh, to stay long? Just valuation, how long the, the cycle is in the tooth? Or? So uh, inflation is always going to be the volatility catalyst, um, certainly in a world that's you know, short, cynical of, of the concept of inflation this day and age. And that's where investors still are, right? I, you know, we call them the 3Ds, right? The growth of debt is disinflationary. Uh, demographics are disinflationary. Tech disruption is disinflationary. And that's why I actually think, you know, from a contrarian perspective, because that's kind of what I do, I zig when others zag, and I look to see where the kind of crowded market narratives can tip over. In this case, this sudden shift to a much more optimistic view into next year looks like the more extended story. I don't see a Fed which is running a completely asymmetric policy from here on out, right. which is that there is almost no bar to cut further and an impossibly high bar, meaning you know, extended, sustained inflation beats, to hike on top of what I believe in terms of the response to the repo funding dynamic. We'll see the Fed move from QE light to QE, as in having to actually buy duration, move into buying U.S. Treasuries instead of just bills. Um, the potential with you know, this benign inflation backdrop for rates to really move. I don't see bonds selling off next year. And if bonds don't sell off, this kind of myth of the resurgence of cyclicals and reflation is going to be just that. So like my favorite trade, and I work in a very tactical one month horizon, but my favorite trade right now is a, is a one month reversal strategy, which is basically completely doing the opposite of what just happened or what is happening right now in December. January is the best month going back to 1986 for a one month reversal strategy. And I think what the phenomenon this is picking up is how, how much passive rebalancing, how much quantitative systematic rebalancing uh, takes place in the market these right. days. And so you're looking at a 3.3% return in January's alone from a one month reversal strategy um, into a month that's the second best seasonal for 10 year treasuries dating back to 86. And what would, a, what would a reversal strategy look like? You'd be short all the stuff that ripped this month. The best two performing S&P sectors, energy and banks. You know, and you'd be long the right. stuff that's underperformed, defensives, which are the bond proxies. That to me, this, by the way, this one month reversal strategy from a market neutral perspective, right? So it's, it's net flat. You're long something and short something is up 36% year to date versus an S&P long only total right. return that's up 30%. I mean, that's incredible. And it just goes to show how much of an impact passive has in the market, mm -hmm. but also too, how much of a narrative overshoot we're potentially moving into. I think we end 2020 with 10 years, 185, huh. right here.